Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this another edition of an information session to talk about links together in our June soft return to the office. My name is Ryan Huff. I'm the communications director at CU Denver and a co-chair of the Links Together Communications Committee. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of topics today. We know you have a lot of questions. And uh, first, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we have a Links Together website set up. That's at ucdenver.edu slash links together. And we have many FAQs there, um, ranging from uh, bus information, parking, uh, health, safety, all kinds of information on there. And I encourage you to look at that website. If you still have further questions, uh, please email us at linkstogether at ucdenver.edu. Today, I'd like to introduce our panel. We have a great panel uh, assembled today. Um, and I'll just share their names with you. Chris Puckett is the Managing Associate University Council and co-chair of the Links Together Task Force. Pamela Yansma is the Dean for the College of Liberal, Liberal Arts and Sciences and also a co-chair of the Links Together Task Force. Todd Haggerty, Vice Chancellor and CFO. Doug Cassian, Human Resources Director of Employee Relations and Performance. Carrie Weatherford is the Director of Institutional Planning. Gregory Gibson, Senior Director of Building Maintenance and Operations. Dr. Samet is a pulmonary physician and epidemiology, uh, epidemiologist and the Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health. And Ann Fieser Olison is the AHEC Director of Facilities and Project Management. Uh, I'd also like to thank the team behind the scenes who will be answering your questions in the Q&A function. So if you have a question uh, during this discussion, please put it in the Q&A chat and uh, we'd be happy to answer that. Uh, so first, I'd like to start with Chris and Pam, our uh, co-chairs of the task force. The world has changed greatly just in the last 10 days as far as uh, safety rules and such. So what will the rules be at uh, CU Denver come June 1st? All right, terrific. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, welcome to all of you who have joined us here on this bright, sunny Monday morning. It was hard to get up and go to work, frankly, um, after a good long weekend. Uh, but thank you for joining us, and uh, thanks for your ongoing interest and questions in links together and how we are going to come back uh, successfully this summer and then serve our students for the for the fall. And I do want to start with uh, some some good news. Um, I want to thank everyone for their ongoing flexibility and commitment to our students, staff and faculty and to everyone to doing their jobs. It has been an incredible year and I continue to be amazed by the flexibility and creativity and innovation that we're seeing. Um, across the board uh, by both our students and staff and faculty. And I, I just want to thank you for that. I want to recognize and acknowledge that this has not been the easiest year. And yet, uh, I think you all have risen to the challenge. And I am grateful and thankful for that. Um, because uh, without you, uh, we wouldn't be able to move forward. So with that, let me, do, let me do give you a couple quick information points that we were able to gather on Friday. So as you know, we do have the mandatory uh, vaccine requirement uh, that we are requiring and starting to implement this fall, uh, beginning of the fall semester. We got some good news on Friday. We were able to uh, get data from Department of Public Health and Environment for our student population. We sent over a, a student list uh, a couple, couple weeks ago. They were able to confirm that of the students they matched, which they matched 84% uh, of them. So that's basically saying 84% of the students that they were able to match had a record in the Colorado database which is pretty consistent with what about 16% out of state international students. And of those 84% of students they were able to match, 80.2 have already been vaccinated, uh, which if you stop and think about it, 80.2 of our students, 82, 80.2% of our students have already been vaccinated, which is just amazing uh, given our population on our campus. Um, we are gonna continue to encourage everyone to get vaccinated, that's the way forward. So 80.2 is a great number, it's a great start for us, um, but we wanna see that number rise. Um, for the other two institutions on campus, we're seeing right around two thirds or 60 to 65% of their students have already been vaccinated on campus, which is uh, tremendous news as well uh, for us to be able to return in the fall. You know, people ask me the questions like, well, what can I do more than anything to get prepared to come back? And I always say this, I always say, get vaccinated and tell somebody about why you've chosen to be vaccinated uh, because that is the way forward for us as a campus. And I think uh, writ, writ large, it's a way for us uh, as a community. So uh, as I think somebody is putting in the chat, there continue to be ongoing opportunities to get vaccinated. Our on-campus clinic um, has daily hours 
um, as well as uh, starting to do some Saturday Sunday events as well in the Pfizer space. That's what they've gotten. They've been able to obtain the Pfizer uh, vaccine. So if you have not gotten it, um, absolutely, please make sure that's a priority. Uh, we're also starting to vaccinate people 12 and up, so 12 plus with parental approval. Um, and so if you have a, somebody who's 12 plus, then let's absolutely get have you and your family show up. We see a lot of that right now in the clinics. Um, we do ask you if you can sign up, uh, but we also have walk-ups available. So um, I'm just going to continue to push that and encourage that. Um, one thing that I will just kind of briefly mention, because it's been, I think, a success of ours, uh, we finished off uh, the second shot of a vaccine equity clinic that we did in partnership with Servicios de la Raza and a number of council people here in Denver. Um, and we were able to vaccinate um, almost, a, well, was about 2,100 people over the two weekends. So over 1,000 folks um, from our BIPOC uh, Latinx uh, communities were able to be vaccinated uh, in those events. And almost two-thirds of that 1,100, I should say, on, uh, on those days were actually BIPOC and uh, people of color, which we were very excited about. We've also been continuing to do some events this last weekend. A number of us actually walked some neighborhoods around Swansea, Barnum, and the MLK rec centers to try and encourage folks in those communities to get vaccinated. So obviously we are gonna continue to push on our uh, own community to, to get vaccinated. Uh, we're gonna continue to provide those opportunities and efforts. Um, but we're also going to try and support uh, those other organizations and areas and spaces that we know still are getting caught up in Colorado. So those are some good news pieces for now. I also want to quickly mention uh, what it is that we're looking at for uh, the summer starting June 1st. So this is uh, literally a week from today. Um, what's the expectation going to be on campus? Well, for vaccinated folks, um, you're not going to have to do any daily health attestations. Um, and in most circumstances, you won't have to wear a mask. Okay, so, however, in certain circumstances, everyone will be wearing masks for CU Denver. That includes in classrooms, in classes, that includes in elevators, and that includes bathrooms as well. We also are going to be uh, requiring everyone to wear a mask uh, in certain locations in the residence hall, although we're still uh, developing that information. For folks who are unvaccinated, they're going to be expected to, to wear a mask at all times while they're on campus indoors, and then also continue the daily health attestations and health check. As we've announced previously, we don't plan on requiring uh, or, or uh, doing any testing of folks who are unvaccinated or uh, in that space until the fall. So we won't be doing weekly tests of folks until the fall, but over the summer, um, we will be asking unvaccinated folks to continue to wear masks at all times indoors and also continue to do the daily attestations. And I think some of us, uh, you will see later today, I think, Ryan, hopefully it'll get posted, um, some talking guidelines and some talking points about our hopes and expectations for how we're going to move forward as a community. Our goal is to move forward, especially with this, va this masking vaccination uh, situation with kindness, respect, and honesty, meaning we can't and we shouldn't ostracize people who are not vaccinated, and we're not going to allow for that to happen. We also are going to be uh, giving you some guidance in some documents that Ryan will be posting hopefully later this week, if not today, about how to have some of those hard conversations with your coworkers, for the people who work for you, for your students, about how can I have conversations about vaccine status. Where are some circumstances that we aren't going to say you probably shouldn't be asking your vaccine status. For example, in your classrooms, that's not going to be a recommendation of ours. You shouldn't be asking your students whether they're vaccinated. Having said that, in certain circumstances, in small offices, for example, it may make sense to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with people in a meeting before they attend to say, are you comfortable meeting without a mask or with a mask? You don't have to ask somebody if whether they're vaccinated or not. You can ask the question. And if somebody isn't comfortable and they say, well, I just, I'm comfortable with if everybody, if, if everybody wears a mask, guess what? We're going to ask everybody to wear a mask, even if you don't have to. Okay. The goal is to be respectful of others' requests and comply, especially if somebody's not comfortable. Right. Um, and I think uh, our hope is that we can move forward successfully in that space. Um, what's also important is physical distancing is going to go away, along with the uh, mask wearing for folks. Um, as for visitors, we do expect visitors will be treated, uh, well, visitors will be required to wear masks, um, and they'll also be required to complete the daily attestation. So that's starting June 1st. 
uh, people will ask, what are we doing in August? And I can tell you, it'll change probably five times at least before doing now in August, what the world's gonna look like. Um, but this is where we're headed. Uh, the guidance, as you know, from CDC, CDPHG, and Denver Public Health and Environment um, is consistent with uh, vaccinated folks being able to go without masks in most circumstances. And we believe that uh, identifying those few situations where we're gonna ask everyone to wear masks is consistent with uh, recognizing that there are gonna be people who make different decisions in our space. So with that, I thank you for uh, your willingness to engage with us. I've heard lots of great conversations are happening about how to return to the office here in June, which continues to be kind of a long runway into August so that we reach our next normal by then. Um, I've heard lots of good conversations about alternative scheduling at times, remote working, um, as well as where it is that makes sense to have people in person. And I'll close with this. Um, one thing that we did here this week, or I heard it last week, is that 74% of our students have at least one course on campus this fall, right? And 26% of our students are fully in person. Now, if you think about that, that's fully in person is probably significantly lower than what we've seen in the past. But that still means there's a good three quarters of our students are gonna be on campus at some time this fall. And I think it's important that we all continue to remember that may not always be at the same times, may not be in the same volume, um, but we are gonna see folks on campus this fall and we're gonna encourage that. And we're gonna see folks in the dorm and we're gonna encourage that as well. So thanks and I'll hand it off to Pam. Hey everyone, I don't have much to add to that. I wanna thank Chris for all the hard work that he's been doing with Links Together. He's really been spearheading the whole thing and really been paying attention to everyone's questions and concerns. So I wanna thank him. And I also just wanna reiterate that we are approaching this with empathy and kindness. And when we think about the soft return, it's June and July to prepare us for August. And like Chris just said, 74% of our students have a class on campus, which is just outstanding. And 80% of our students are vaccinated. So things are looking up. I hope we can go to our next normal and that summer will be good for everyone. And just remember that June and July is a time for all of us to try out coming back to the office and where we feel comfortable and that it's not a rigid thing. You don't have to be there every single Tuesday and Wednesday in June and every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday in July. We're gonna work it out for what's best for our students and for the rest of us to keep CU Denver going. So thank you very much. And thank you for attending today and for everything you've done during the past year and a half. It's hard to believe it's been so long, but that we're finally crawling out from underneath that rock. So thank you, everyone. Thanks to you both for that. Uh, let's bring in Dr. Samet. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the COVID infection rates, uh, hospitalizations spread right now? How, how are things looking today versus a few months ago? And so I wish they looked a little better. I'll start with, uh, with that. So uh, Colorado's had an interesting course over the last um, month or two. We um, hit our low in uh, March, and then unfortunately the epidemic curve crept up. And then it went down over the last few weeks, but is now sort of stalled out at a plateau. So the infection is still with us. I mean, I think the good news is that vaccination will continue to bring the curve down. It's just not doing it as fast as we would like to see it. So just by reference, um, last week we estimated that slightly under 1% of Coloradans are still infectious. That figure has been as high as two and a half, but far lower. So right now, I think we are sort of seeing an ongoing uh, competition, if you will, between the consequences of lightening up restrictions. Uh, we've had a high rate of the B117 variant. Then, of course, the increasing benefits of vaccination. So I'm, I'm looking forward to a uh, further decline in cases. I just wish it were happening uh, faster. But, um, you know, I, I think we, of course, know that uh, vaccination works and we need all Coloradans to get vaccinated. So we've been pretty used to the six foot distancing rule for almost a year now. Um, tell us why that rule has gone away for CDC, Colorado, and many other places. Right. I mean, in, in a sense, getting rid of the uh, physical distancing is the reward for vaccination. And uh, we've done well with that. And I, I think for those who are vaccinated, uh, particularly while mixing with 
other folks who are vaccinated, uh, there's really no risk of uh, transmission. Um, so I, I think it's a, a good thing and a positive step forward. And, you know, part of our um, return towards uh, normalcy. So obviously, as, as Chris cited, um, that majority of our students are vaccinated. And I assume um, that's, that's true for our faculty and staff as well. Uh, but a lot of us have children who are under the age of 12 and can't get vaccinated yet. Um, should there be any concern if we uh, say I'm, an, uh, I'm a vaccinated individual and I'm mixing with somebody unvaccinated, could they give me COVID and could I pass it on to my kids maybe who are not vaccinated? Right. So these vaccines are highly effective. You know, we've seen, we know the efficacy is in the range of 90 to 95% for the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. So 95% is awfully good. It's not 100%. And so there's some risk of uh, transmission. And we do know that we're seeing so-called breakthrough cases, uh, infections in people who have been vaccinated. Uh, our expectation is that from the clinical perspective, these will be very mild. So again, there is some, uh, Ryan, as you alluded to, some possibility of vaccinated persons transmitting, um, becoming infected, uh, perhaps transmitting to others. I think we know, we know that people who are vaccinated can carry the virus. We know very little about, however, whether they can actually transmit the virus. Two different uh, phenomena. And, and the last question for the, the time being, Dr. Samet, uh, these variants that, that you talk about, how effective are the current vaccines against those variants? Right. We're fortunate. The current vaccines um, work against the variants that we have um, in hand, uh, work against the one that's plagued Colorado, the B117. So we're okay there. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, we, we have a, a few questions coming in on the various rules, and um, one of them is, if students are not vaccinated in the research lab, can the supervisor ask them to be vaccinated? Typically, in most circumstances, no. Um, you know, the, the, the way we are approaching the vaccine uh, requirement is that folks either are vaccinated, and if they're unvaccinated, they uh, need to get tested every week. Um, could there be certain activities that folks uh, who are fully vaccinated can engage in that others potentially may not be uh, at some point, for example, maybe domestic travel, some other types of situations? Potentially, yes. But in most circumstances, uh, in a research lab, it's going to be difficult to be able to say you have to get vaccinated or not. Uh, but you know, this is part of the reason we do these um, town halls is for people to ask hard questions and uh, we don't always have the easy answers. So if uh, whoever wants, if they want to follow up with me on that one, I'm, that's that's one I'm happy to follow up on. How about uh, masks in the rec center? Are those required if you're vaccinated? You know, this has been an ongoing conversation with Amber and um, we have not made any final decisions about that. I think Chris would ask that question. We haven't made any final decisions about uh, what kind of circumstances we would uh, allow people to continue to be unmasked. Um, I think it in part has to do with the vaccination status, um, but we'll be working with Amber this week, Amber Long, and we'll get you more information before the first on that one. Great, thank you. Almost as popular as our health and safety questions are the parking questions, and I'll just bring in uh, Gregory here. Obviously, before we uh, get to work and all that, we need to uh, you know arrive and park or take the bus. So uh, Gregory, why don't you talk about uh, what are the parking uh, rules uh, for the summer? Well, thank you for the question, Ryan, and I'm pleased to remind the university community or those that do not know that for the months of June and July 2021, parking in CU Denver, as well as the business school garages, there will be no charge for parking. This is because it's considered general parking, which means that permit holders will not have to have an assigned space, but they will have access to any space that they want in either of these garages. However, the Lawrence Street Center garage will remain a reserved parking garage with space numbers assigned to each permit holder. Uh, we know that there's always interest in people trying to get on the waiting list for availability there. So we have a we have a uh, an email address that we can ask you to notify us. We can put you on the list. That email address is downtown.parking at ucdenver.edu. As far as August and the fall return goes. Uh, parking fees for all garages will resume on August 31st, 2021. However, parking, you'll be available to park as of August 1st. We're just going to charge you at the end of the month. Parking uh, deductions will be, uh, you know, kind of corrected at that time. If you have previously canceled your parking at either the CU 
or business club or garages, you will need to submit a new online request to start. If you've got questions, again, I would refer you to the email downtown.parking at ucdenver.edu or go to the parking website under the Denver tab. But most importantly, we're excited to announce a new part-time rate for parking for the fall because of the nature of people coming to work in a hybrid manner. There will be a parking, a part-time parking rate for those that work on campus three days or less a week, or for those that work two days or less per week. So that's something new, and uh, we're pleased to have that implementation scheduled for the fall. As far as overflow parking goes, we have options available for the Auraria campus. Uh, we would also ask you to reference the Auraria campus park website for additional parking options for the fall. But if you have any questions regarding anything related to parking, I would ask you to call our enthusiastic facility support staff at 303-315-7777, or again, reference the downtown.parking at ucdenver.edu email address. Thank you, Gregory. And uh, I'll bring in Todd here. Obviously, if you're if you're not driving, perhaps you're uh, taking the, the bus or light rail or commuter rail uh, to work. And Todd, I understand you have an exciting announcement about EcoPasses. <laughs> I do. And this has been one long, long in the coming here. And I know everyone's had a lot of questions in this space. So as many may know, <clears throat> we, we were able to go into a pilot program with RTD throughout the spring semester, which allowed students, faculty, and staff to opt in for $123 to get a pass for the, the spring semester. Now this pilot program ends June 30th. So that left us with a big question mark of what's gonna occur beyond June 30th. And uh, because of this pilot program, RTD had to embark on a, on a fair equity study. And they're doing a fair equity study across the entire uh, uh, RTD uh, uh, service area now, which is going to take some time. So that led us to you know, start to get creative and start working with our partners at RTD along with our Auraria campus uh, uh, partners as well with uh, uh, AHEC, the Metro State University and CCD. And we're happy to announce that we are just about to sign the contract on, on the dotted line here that we'll be able to provide the EcoPass to faculty and staff beginning July 1st for $135 and that will go all the way to December 31st. So we'll have that entire period covered. Uh, for our faculty and staff, and we're also working on the college pass as well for our students. So our students will have roughly the same kind of price and charge and an opt-in option for them to safely get to campus as well throughout the, the, the fall semester. And we'll continue our negotiations ongoing from there, but as I mentioned, the fair equity study is going to be a huge, huge piece in all this. But I am so happy that we have finally come to a, a deal here and are going to be able to, I think, offer something that's fairly affordable, about $25 per month. Uh, that uh, faculty and staff will be able to be able to continue to utilize RTD beginning July 1. And there'll be more details of how you can obtain this pass coming out shortly here through the uh, through our partners at AHEC. That's great. No, congratulations, Todd. I, I know many people will be excited about that. Uh, you know, we have uh, questions from some people on, is it safe to ride the bus? Uh, what are the rules on the bus? You know, we tried to get um, someone from RTD to join us, but maybe, Todd, can you just speak to just general safety protocols? Yeah. Um, and I know that probably Chris or Dr. Semek can, can chime in on this as well, but the federal mask guidelines remain in place at a minimum through September 13th for public transportation. So that's if you're you know, on a plane, train, or, or bus, that the mask requirement is still, is still required. So uh, that part of the safety protocol is still in place, and it will be at least through uh, September 13th at a minimum. On top of that, and you can go to RTD's website and they have rtd.com slash COVID to see all their health and safety protocols that they are doing daily to protect customers and also for their own employees, including cleaning protocols and all kinds of other things. So let's sit there and say, for, at least for the time being on, on the health side of things here related to COVID, they're keeping the mask in place, at least through the fall, the beginning of fall. Uh, and you can always get more information uh, from rtd.com slash COVID. All right, thank you, Todd. Uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat about ventilation. And so these next ones, uh, uh, Gregory and Anne, Anne, maybe we can start with you. Can you talk about uh, Auraria's, uh, you know, proactive nature of what you do for uh, ventilation? Sure, thanks. Um, We've continued to run our HVAC systems at 100% capacity, even though um, the campus hasn't been fully occupied over the last year. We never stopped. Um, so the, the systems have been running 
and weren't completely shut off at any time. We have upgraded uh, all of the filter systems to meet the increased filtration requirement that ASHRAE, which is um, a heating and air conditioning standards um, and CDC uh, recommended. So all of our HVAC filters have been increased to something called MERV 13, which is the rating that is typically used in uh, hospitals. So we have definitely moved to um, make sure that the filters are pulling out as much um, of the particles in the air as possible. We also are changing those filters more frequently. So I saw one question on here that specifically related to the Tivoli and said um, things have kind of smelled musty in there and windows don't open. Um, most of our buildings don't have windows that open, um, but I will go back and check specifically on the Tivoli. The air systems have been running there. I'm just guessing that there have been some suites that haven't had any people in them at all, but um, everything has continued to run. Um, and if you have a specific suite that you'd like us to take a look at, you can add that in the chat. I'll certainly uh, follow up and look at that. Thank you. Uh, Gregory, how about it? See you, Denver. Well, I'm very excited to be able to tell you about some of the hard work that's been accomplished by our caring, knowledgeable, and experienced facilities team. In the beginning, our facilities management team set the amount of ventilation in the building to at least sub exceed the ASHRAE 62.1-2019 standard, which advises to inspect the air handling systems to ensure that ventilation, exhaust, mixed air, and outside dampers are operating appropriately to allow uh, fresh ventilation into the building. Our facilities management team has calculated the current outside air percentage of mixture and made those appropriate adjustments per the guidelines and recommendation uh, from ASHRAE, which stands for American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. This is the people that call the ball on these types of issues, as well as satisfying EPA requirements and those from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. Our facilities teams also perform routine preventive maintenance, inspections and audits of building maintenance, maintenance equipment to verify that air handling units and outside air control dampers are functioning and controlling correctly per the appropriate specifications and guidelines that I just referenced. Our facilities team has increased the amount of ventilation in the building to beyond to exceed the standard up to the maximum that the HVA system can handle. As an example, our facilities team has opened all outside air dampers to all air handling units in each building on campus to their max position. Uh, we have performed frequent maintenance checks to make sure that our facilities are uh, appropriate, our facilities and equipment are working appropriately. And our facilities team also has the capability to monitor ventilation systems for our CU Denver facilities through our building automation system software which allows us to even monitor system function at the room and building levels and make adjustments where needed uh, in order to ensure that we're having the optimum utilization of airflow. We uh, keep the condens the air condition, air handler cooling coils, you know, <laughs> condensate pans, condensate traps clean and functional. We have, as uh, was referenced by Anne, we've upgraded all of our air filters to at least MERV 13 and higher where we were able, again, to the capacity of the system. Just for a piece of information, MERV stands for a minimum efficiency reporting value. It's a highly efficient filter. Then because of their high filtration rate, MERV filters have been shown in studies to be highly effective at removing particle sizes that may carry viruses and also mitigate the transmission of infectious aerosol and or airborne particles. And as Dan also referenced, this is uh, MERV 13 filter is considered to provide hospital level air quality. And you know, just a lot, our final word on this, some of the additional steps that we've been taking to mitigate risks and include bringing our building performance team from the entrance campus to perform audits of each of the CU Denver buildings. We first did this exercise in, uh, in advance of the fall semester of 2020. We also did it again before the spring semester of 21. And this will be something that we do ongoing as we come to the fall. Our facilities team has validated that every single air handler is performing in a mechanically sound manner for optimum performance, and we will continue to do so. Thank you very much to you both. I appreciate hearing that information.
Uh, I'll just answer a quick question in the chat. It was a, a question about the EcoPast and $135 is that per year, per semester. That $135 payment covers uh, July 1st through December 31st. Um, all right, let's uh, go to another mode of transportation. Uh, this question is for, for Carrie. Uh, can we install more bike racks or bike shelters for those who wish to commute that way? Uh, this seems to be very limited on the downtown side of campus. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> As a uh, frequent bike commuter, I, I really appreciate this question. Um, the answer is I would I would love to hear um, from the person that asked that question and anyone who's a bike commuter and to learn a little bit more about your experience and, and the issues that you may have had due to a lack of capacity uh, for bike parking. What I will say is that um, my team in institutional planning works frequently with Gregory Gibson's team and our projects team to assess bike racks around the campus. And uh, I appreciate this comment and question because I would love to, to team up with, with Greg and with the facilities projects folks and do an audit of our buildings and figure out if there are in fact some locations where we can add some additional bike parking, uh, particularly on the, on the downtown side of the campus. We are adding quite a few additional bike racks as part of the City Heights um, residence hall projects. We're excited to see those come in, um, but please do reach out to me uh, if you encounter any issues with bicycle parking. And uh, having said that, I will definitely work with my partner teams and figure out if there's some places where we can add some additional bike parking. Hey, Carrie, I'd also add on that that um, AHEC in uh, collaboration with uh, CU Denver built a new uh, bike shelter, which is right at the North Classroom site that has a capacity for 50 bikes. That was just finished this spring and will open in time for the fall semester. So people who haven't been on campus may not have seen that bike shelter as well as one that's between Central and the library that also holds 50 bikes. And it's a completely enclosed um, structure that was designed by the CU Denver Architectural Department. Thank you, Ann and Carrie. Uh, just wanted to respond to uh, Gregory, pass along some information from the chat. Uh, there was a question on whether the shuttle uh, between downtown Denver and Anschutz will return for the fall and, and that is not anticipated um, at this time. Um, wanted to move to uh, some more health questions. Uh, Dr. Samet, there have been a, a couple of questions in the chat and I um, believe you answered one of these, but just for those who didn't see it already, um, this uh, person asked, do you think the CDC relaxed the mask guidelines too early? Yeah, I, I answered that one privately. You know, I, it's probably sort of no win whenever it was relaxed, I think. And uh, I think the uh, part of the rationale for relaxing was that in truth, people who are vaccinated uh, don't need it. I think where complications have come is sort of dealing with a mixture of people, some vaccinated and uh, a substantial number still not vaccinated and having uh, guidelines. And I, I think that has proved uh, complicated. I mean, I, I don't run the show here. Uh, so, you know, my opinion is simply uh, that I've regarded masks as no regret strategy and one that uh, is a, is a good one because it both provides protection. I think it provides a reminder that we are in a, in a pandemic situation still. So holding on longer might have uh, been helpful, but I think on the other hand, saying if you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask was, a, was an incentive. So we know where the decision makers came out on this. Another question for you. One person asks, uh, if I already received the J&J &J vaccine, should I or can I also get the Pfizer or Moderna? Yeah, I'd stick with one, and that's the recommendation. And uh, I know the efficacy is perhaps somewhat lower on the uh, J&J. It proved uh, highly efficacious uh, in avoiding severe uh, disease. You know, there's certainly talk already about, quote, boosters, and I think we will need to learn what we all get next. We have to learn still how long this uh, or vaccination acquired immunity lasts. And then of course, there'll be the question of whether, you know, continued mutations of the SARS-CoV-2 virus bring us, you know, uh, strains that may not be as uh, susceptible as we want to current vaccines. So I would uh, hang on and uh, I, I guess I'm hopeful that we'll have a year or more run out of the vaccines that we've already had before we 
<laughs> start to hear about getting quote booster shots. Thank you. Uh, another vaccination question. This one is more of a legal question. So I'll turn this to Chris. Uh, if this is in the chat, if a student tells me that they are vaccinated, even though I did not request that information, can I tell a third party? I, I think it depends on for what purpose. Uh, I, you know, I, I think if somebody comes forward and says they're vaccinated, I don't know that I would say run house vaccinated, run house vaccinated. You know, I, I think. Oh, uh, I am. I know you are. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think it depends on the purpose. I think, um, you know, we've gotten some questions and I think this is a fair one, which is, um, you know, there are going to be people, people who are vaccinated and may not be comfortable telling us their status um, because they have uh, privacy concerns or whatnot. And for those folks, uh, you know, we're going to treat them as if they've requested an exemption and, and put them into a treat. Uh, mask wearing requirement as well as um, doing testing. So I think that um, if somebody tells you their vaccine status, I think they're telling you for a purpose or probably for a specific reason. Um, I would be hesitant. I don't know that you just go blab that everywhere, but at the same time, um, what I am learning, and I think you all are in the same place when I'm around certain family members, I know those certain family members are vaccinated. I know other, certain family members are not vaccinated. So I, I, I perhaps handle myself a little di differently in those contexts. So I, I, mean, I would say this, I think, uh, especially in the university environment, you need to be respectful and kind and, and clear that you cannot retaliate against anybody for any reason uh, for letting you know their vaccine status. Um, and in most circumstances, it's probably not something you're gonna share, right? Um, so long-winded answer to a simple question. Well, and we probably also can't assume if somebody is wearing a mask and they're in an office environment, that doesn't mean they're unvaccinated. There are vaccinated people who may just want to continue to wear masks. Absolutely. My nine-year-old, for example, is not vaccinated because he's too young right now, but um, he likes to, he, he did it this weekend too. We were outside doing something. And I said, you know, you don't have to wear your mask. And he's like, no, dad, I want to. And I'm like, okay. I, you know, I, I, I think there's some body integrity, safety things with that kid. Um, but at the same time, I'm happy to support him and say, okay, I'll do what you want to do too. And he'll say, dad, I want you to. And I'm like, okay, I'm happy to do what makes you feel comfortable. So I think we're going to be in that space for a while. Um, and I think there are going to be spaces perhaps uh, from now for a long time that we're going to be dealing with, including, you know, mass transit where we're going to be wearing masks. I think airplanes, we're going to be wearing masks. Um, you know, and I think our kids, it's going to be interesting to see what my kid does because he knows he he didn't he liked not getting sick this year you know even if he's not required to next year if he gets the vaccine he still may wear a mask um so we'll i think we're in a, in a it's going to be fascinating from a sociological standpoint and public health standpoint what what we learn out of this time so another question in the chat uh, uh chris uh, what if we are vaccinated but other people in our household are not are we allowed to be back on campus yes Yes, I mean, I think the, the information we're hearing from scientists is that, you know, the likelihood that somebody who's vaccinated and is carrying it back and forth is, is the risk is low. Um, having said that, if someone's not comfortable, um, I mean, they can absolutely wear masks as Dr. Samet said, that's clearly proven effective the last year. And one other question, um, if we say have a large group meeting and uh, we can't um, poll everyone on their uh, mask preference, um, what are the rules there as far as whether we wear masks or not, because we may not know if people are vaccinated or not? Is that a campus le level policy or is that for units to decide? I would say it's not a campus level policy at the moment, but I think part of what you'll see here, um, I, that's not a campus level policy, but I think at the moment, um, my... Well, Chris, I think you're on mute. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Brian. <laughs> Oh, Zoom. Um, you know, I think that that's an interesting one. We haven't we haven't made it a campus level decision at this point that we are going to require meetings of a certain size or a certain mixture of folks uh, be required to wear masks. Um, that continues to be a, a unit level decision. I think that one in particular is one I I think a number of us have thought a lot about, and that may change, frankly, as we move forward. Um, I think the idea with classrooms in particular was period of time, how long are you in the room, how close are you to the people around you, um, what's the likelihood you're going to have connections with those folks and know their status or not. 
Um, and and in that on that way, weighing of risk, it was look, classrooms make a lot of sense to require masks. Um, at the moment, we haven't made that same call for uh, meetings. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doug, I have a few HR questions. Um, can you tell us about the updated uh, campus flexible work policy? Sure, thanks. Yes, I understand there's a lot of interest uh, in understanding that. And uh, what that is, is it identifies parameters for and conditions that have to exist in order to support a remote uh, uh, work arrangement. Um, and it also identifies the approval process and who has to approve that. Um, the approval process is uh, initiated in the department and the decision remains in the department um, with regard to uh, uh, approving those. Um, so it'll go to the, the, the head of that particular department, whether that's the dean or the chancellor or the provost or the unit vice chancellor um, uh, for approval. But the types of things that need to be considered um, uh, include productivity, uh, the ability to uh, for a supervisor to uh, gauge productivity. Um, we need to make sure we're not burdening that individual's colleagues uh, in any way uh, in uh, making that kind of arrangement. Uh, are we meeting our customer service needs, our peak workloads? Uh, are, has the supervisor determined the individual is able to work uh, independently and pro, uh, productively? And can the supervisor evaluate performance uh, on a remote basis? So um, that, that's the kind of uh, general uh, things it covers. Okay. Um, you know, we hear from some parents who say, you know, this is a unique summer. It's not as easy to get childcare, summer camps and such. Um, for example, at least the month of June as we're easing into it, you know, what kind of flexibility do employees have with their supervisors? Right. We'll be looking to engage in some kind of dialogue on mutually agreeable solutions uh, for the summer. You know, my understanding is that, you know, yeah, we are in a kind of soft return here for the summer. So hopefully, um, you know, there'll be some uh, flexibility allowed. Um, that, of course, may change going into the fall, but uh, we'll be looking to, 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 to have uh, supervisors talk about those things with their employees, and we'll be engaged uh, as, a, as a human resources office uh, at the appropriate points. Yeah. And for the month of June, we're looking for employees to be in the office 20 to 30 percent of the time or so. So I want to ask you to speak for all supervisors. But if somebody said, hey, can I work Monday through Friday, the second week of June, because that's the week I can have my kid in the summer camp. Those are the kinds of arrangements that could be possibly worked out. We, we, one would hope there would be the flexibility there. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, last question for you for now, um, Doug, can you tell us about the Skillsoft training for the managers we have on the call here on uh, managing a hybrid team? Yeah, there's a training out there for supervisors to kind of understand what they need to take into consideration in managing uh, a hybrid team. Um, it, you know, it's been uh, set up by uh, our uh, uh, director of uh, learning and development, and uh, believe it will be very helpful and insightful for individuals to uh, kind of hone their skills in this um, new reality. All right, thank you, Doug. Uh, we have some more facilities questions. Uh, these ones are about drinking fountains. Um, they obviously have not had as much use over the past year as they normally would. And uh, so this person asks about cleaning them. Uh, is there a way to know that the, the water quality is good? Is there a way to test them? And that would be, I guess, for, for maybe both Anne and, uh, and Gregory. The simple answer is yes. And it's something that our facility staff has been engaged in since the beginning of the pandemic. Just because the, just because the population hasn't necessarily been in the building, our regularly scheduled preventive maintenance tasks require us to do this on at least a bi monthly, twice, twice a month basis. Okay. And same for AHEC. Um, we've continued to have our custodial staff actually go through and use and run the water um, drinking fountains, the sinks, and the toilets just so that we are ensuring that we have water continuing to flow through the system. Um, and as Gregory just mentioned, we also have to test on a regular basis. So 
Um, I'd be interested in knowing if there's a specific place that somebody's encountered what they term to be a musty tasting um, water so that I can look at that specific unit, but um, they are all having water run through them on a regular basis. All right, thank you. Uh, this, uh, Doug, our uh, HR conversation inspired another question. This one might be for either you or, or Chris, but uh, what if supervisors are adamant that employees return to the office 100% of the time? Do employees have any recourse to negotiate a hybrid schedule? Well, let me just take a, a few points here. We'd have to kind of understand why the request is being made by the employee. Um, you know, are there uh, health concerns involved, uh, you know, where an accommodation might be appropriate? And, and we'd, you know, really like to work this out. So we'd, we'd have to have a discussion with this supervisor to kind of see, you know, what, what are the justifications here for um, requiring 100% time in person. So there's some unknowns we'd, we'd have to discover here. And Chris, do you have more to add to that? No, I would. I think though, Doug, you're, you're going the direction I was headed, which is we have had a process where people can ask for uh, kind of workplace modifications in the past. And we kind of had that over the last year. And I would anticipate that if, if somebody is in that spot, they could ask the same question uh, and, and have HR get involved potentially in that. Um, you know, because I think there may be there may be exactly that uh, details that drive a specific conversation in this space, um, and 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 there are I mean, and I think we I look, there are certain jobs that are in person jobs, and uh, you know I think there's there is going to continue to be uh, ongoing conversation about the, what that looks like. And for those of you who don't know, I am sitting here in my office. You know, uh, I was going to show you my background. Um, so I think there are lots of folks who are starting to come back in person. Um, surprisingly so, but, uh, you know, I think there is an opportunity for that to, to be handled through HR's modification process. And I think we do plan on putting that link up on the Links Together website. Great. Uh, we have some vaccine questions. Um, this might be for either Dr. Samet or, or Chris, but for those who cannot be fully vaccinated because they have a reaction to the vaccine, uh, what might change for them as far as any rules or, or showing up to work? Well, that's an interesting one. I, I, um, I presumably they've received the first dose of something. Um, what do you think, Dr. Salmon? I was I was waiting for you to answer, Chris. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know the um, I think the the question here. I mean, I you know fortunately it seems that very few people have um, immediate reactions. Although I'm aware of people having um, allergy type interactions. Somebody getting one dose would be partially vaccinated for a time. And I, I, I think then comes the question of how to handle them. I, I suppose it would be awkward to create a third category. So I think they're gonna have to fit into the vaccinated or the unvaccinated. And um, you know, I think the, probably the main question, we know that such individuals get to a reasonable place of immunity, maybe 80% within a couple of weeks. We don't know how long it lasts with one. So I'm, I'm this, and the safest thing for those individuals is to wear a mask and act as if they were unvaccinated, although hopefully they're partially protected. And hopefully we don't have too many individuals like that. Uh, this next question is about if there were to be a COVID outbreak on campus um, this fall or say this summer, um, what is the threshold that will determine a change of uh, on-campus operations? Yeah, that's a great question. We worked on this, gosh, a year ago, <laughs> a year, two months ago, three months ago. We really worked on trying to identify some specific metrics that we would have for outbreaks and or uh, cases on campus, and, and we've struggled. We struggled with it, frankly, because um, just so you all know, we didn't have an, technically we didn't have an outbreak until the last month in April uh, in the dorms. Meaning we didn't truly have an outbreak of transmission that we knew that occurred on campus in any any location other than. Uh, uh, a, a, a boyfriend girlfriend situation in the dorms and then some of their friends. Um, until then, we didn't have an outbreak on campus. And so I would just say, I think this is something we continue to have lots of conversations about um, and with Denver Public Health and with higher ed institutions across the country, frankly, about what is appropriate and where we might tip into a different status. Thankfully, we, we frankly haven't seen that. I think for us, 
uh, one of the things Dr. Samet mentioned earlier is something I would say from an institutional standpoint is breakthrough cases when, when somebody gets, if we if there's each, people getting ill who have been vaccinated, I think that's gonna be a high concern. Um, but this frankly is gonna be a space that we're gonna rely on our experts in, um, both the city and the state um, as, as far as where, where cases are headed. Uh, we have another um, question here. If students are asking other students in the classroom if they are vaccinated, how should faculty handle that? Well, I mean, I think if, if somebody's being bullied or pushed or dealt with inappropriately, then a faculty should step into that and you know address the inappropriate behavior. If somebody wants to ask somebody whether they got the vaccine or not, it seems to me to be something that... Um, frankly, is becoming more and more common um, in different circumstances. So I, I don't think uh, it's going to become unusual. I think this is something that we're going to have to create some guidance for. Um, Ryan, I think I was just thinking about the document we put together. We put some, some, some kind of FAQs or some guidelines. This is probably one of those spaces we're going to need to put some guidelines out there and give some people some ideas. And is it different peer-to-peer -peer versus a supervisor saying, I need to know your vaccination status? Absolutely, you've got it spot on, which is we don't want to coerce, we don't want to retaliate. Somebody's peer to peer, then uh, then it seems to make a lot of sense to me in many circumstances that those conversations are going to happen. Another uh, facilities question, uh, and this is how often are spaces cleaned, say the elevators, bathrooms, door handles, common areas? Right, so facilities uh, manages a very wonderful and caring service provider. Uh, this is kind of their protocol. They're responsible for cleaning common area spaces, which is essentially a general wipe down, scrub cleanup, vacuuming in the areas of entrances and exits for buildings, restrooms, circulation areas, that's like elevators, stairwells and corridors, and common areas like the lounges and seating areas. And the lounges and the seating areas will also get a fogging uh, once weekly. Uh, these other areas, general wipe downs, fill up with cleaning, vacuuming, that happens multiple times daily as well as for high touch points, such as push plates, door handles, push buttons, hard surface furnishings. Uh, when it comes to classrooms, uh, there's the responsibility of facilities to provide the cleaning materials for those within the classroom. So it would be the individuals within the classrooms that would be performing the service, but facilities will provide those services and the cleaning, the environmental services provider will be fogging the classrooms on a daily basis. As far as offices goes, the areas that would be cleaned in the offices would be uh, reception areas, conference rooms, copy mail rooms, uh, kitchenettes, offices, and personal offices can be done upon request. So if you need supplies for your classroom or you need supplies for your office floor cleaning, uh, I would recommend that you reach out to the facilities operation. The email address will be capital DC underscore facilities underscore dispatch at ucdenver.edu or call any of our enthusiastic facility support representatives at 303-715-1111. Uh, 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 Thank you. And do you have anything to add from the AHEC perspective? Um, from the AHEC perspective, we are um, embarking on a program to put um, spray bottles and cloths in every classroom. They're already there for the in-person classrooms that were being used this spring, um, but that will be available and will need to be sprayed down by students um, who are in that room. Again, as uh, Gregory said, all the high touch um, areas are gonna be done on a rotating basis throughout the day. So our normal cleaning people We'll just be going from the bathrooms to the elevators to the lounge areas and just continually sweeping and um, cleansing those. Dr. Samet, I believe in a, a past panel, you said um, much more common for somebody to pass it airborne, a cough in a, a close by space. Um, how common do uh, people pass COVID from say an elevator button or a door handle or a contact? I think uh, as time has gone on, we've learned that you know, so-called surface or fomite transmission, which got so much emphasis uh, at the start is probably far less important than uh, aerosols, the small particles. So I think uh, these concerns, I mean, you know, the potential for transmission, somebody perhaps infected, touching their nose or 
sneezing or coughing, spraying droplets. There's some immediate potential, but I think that pathway is of far less importance as we gain, seems to be of far less importance as we gain understanding of the role of aerosols of very small particles. Thank you. We have a question about, obviously there's uh, shared spaces um, uh, among the uh, various entities on the AHEC campus. Um, MSU announced a end of the mass mandate and social distancing for vaccinated individuals. Uh, the question is how should shared facilities such as the library handle this difference uh, among institutions? I'll jump into that more, As uh, We'll let you know before uh, June 1st. Uh, this is part of my job this week is to uh, negotiate through uh, what MSU announced and uh, what CU Denver is planning on doing as well. So uh, my hope is that uh, we will have that uh, information to you on June 1st. How about any uh, guidelines on how many people can ride in an elevator? And then a question on will all entrance and exit doors be open in June? Will we still have to go one way? Uh, we don't have to go one way. Those, many of those signs are being taken down right now. Uh, same thing with the elevators. We don't going to put restrictions, obviously, uh, though they are a location where people absolutely are going to be required to wear masks. Uh, we started having conversations about, uh, do we put little packets of masks in the elevators to make sure and hand them out? Uh, you know, my preference, and this is what I think Fauci says, and I'm sure Dr. Sam does too as well, is this is going to be a time when you carry around a mask in your pocket for a while. And uh, that's going to be one of those things that uh, generally you're not in an elevator for that long. Um, and so that's, that's, but you are in close contact. So that's why the mask, uh, mandate is, is there as well. Dr. Samet, were you, I saw you unmute. Did you want to add something? Well, I was just going to comment. I write this weekly commentary, and I think about two weeks ago, I said exactly what Chris said. I said, if there's any uh, doubt, carry a mask and put it on. So, Got it. Well, we have just about a minute or two left. Um, we have answered uh, just about 70 questions in the Q&A. So thank you to our audience for submitting those. And thanks to our both on camera and behind the scenes panelists for uh, your answers. Uh, just before we close, I wanted to turn over to Chris and uh, Pam, if you have any closing words. I don't, other than thank you. Thank you, thank you for your participation in this and where we're headed. I think Ryan and, and many of us are not sure what the next steps in our links together uh, uh, voyage or journey is going to be. Uh, I think we do want to talk about uh, probably later in the summer, some uh, meetings and town halls specifically uh, directed towards faculty as they plan to return uh, in a much larger setting. Um, but I would say, you know, I think when we started this over a year ago, I, you know, I could not have predicted where we are, nor our flexibility in getting here. And that's really your flexibility and your willingness to do what it takes. And I have been impressed by uh, everybody's combined spirit and willingness to jump in. And I, frankly, I look forward to seeing people on campus. It's good. I, I hugged somebody I hadn't hugged in over a year this weekend. Um, and I forget that's, that, that's a huge part of who we are. So I look forward to doing more of that. And I'll just echo what Chris said, and, and exactly, no one knew what we were going to be facing when this all started 14, 15 months ago, and to be coming out tentatively, and, and everyone who has done remarkable things, which is everyone, uh, all this past year, thank you very much, and we just need to be a little bit more patient as we figure out this uncertain landscape that hopefully becomes a little bit more certain each day. And so I hope everyone has a chance to have some downtime with friends, family this summer and all the best. And thank you so much. Well, thank you to all our, our panelists and uh, behind the scenes panelists. We, we appreciate your time. And just a reminder, if you want to go back and view any of this or have others who missed this session, uh, give us a day or two. And on the Links Together website, we will post this video. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. And we'll, we'll uh, see you hopefully in person next week. Take care.